Everyone, welcome to, um, I guess it's week 11, chapter 10 of our packages book club with R4DS. Um, this week, um, we are getting further into the uh, metadata section, um, and we're going to talk about package dependencies, specifically. Um, looking at when you should take a dependency on. Um, feel free, um, you know, to uh, ask any questions during the presentation uh, through the chat or definitely feel free to unmute. Um, that's probably preferred, um, but either way, questions or comments, um, definitely feel free to bring those on. Um, so this section is actually a new section of, of the book, uh, of, uh, the second edition, um, it's adapted from a blog post and talk by Jim Hester, um, who we've seen previously in, um, some of the previous chapters of the book, um, Jim used to work for our studio and is now at Netflix. Um, I, yeah, I didn't know that he was no longer at uh, Posit Our Studio. Um, yeah, so this this is based on uh, talk and blog posts by him. Um, so I was interested in in this chapter because. Um, uh, this is an area I'm not too familiar with, um, with, with package development. Um, I know they say, um, I think it's further in the notes too. They say like, if this is a chapter that you can come back to, um, when you're further along in your package development jersey, uh, journey, excuse me. Um, uh, it, Maybe not all of it will apply to you um, currently, but uh, this is definitely one that you want to keep in mind to revisit. Um, so not all dependencies are equal. Um, there's a cost associated with adding a dependency uh, that make them not equal. Um, and so it goes into a few different ways that um, they could be different in cost um uh the type um whether it's the base and recommended packages versus non cran repository packages um i thought it was interesting too like um even when uh even when i installed the um the package or or project for the book club, um, and it asks if you want to update the packages, and then it defers makes the difference between like, do you want to update CRAN packages versus all packages? Uh, anyway, I thought that was interesting, and uh, I, I'm not sure if that's really relevant or not. Um, there could be. Uh, a big cost in the number of upstream uh, dependencies, um, poten potentially a large number of uh, recursive dependencies. Um, like it could, depending on the package, it could be like upward of like 200 dependencies just for one package. And that's, that can be very cumbersome versus uh, some other packages that may not have any dependencies or, or very minimal dependencies. Um, you may have some already fulfilled dependencies. Um, so it would be uh, a lower cost um, since you already have those uh, packages included. Um, and I think one of the examples in the book was uh 
the dplyr package, or I know there's other ways to pronounce that. Um, uh, one of the packages that it relies on, I think they use Tibble as an example. So that's something that's already like, if you have dplyr, then you kind of get Tibble as a bonus. Um, so that's kind of the idea there. Uh, you want to think about the cost of, you know, how cumbersome or uh, how much of a burden it is to install, um, whether that's compilation time, like depending on package size, it could take anywhere from a few seconds to, you know, a minute or I guess even several minutes. Um, and then uh, the binary package size, I, I think they used uh, like a bioconductor example where one of their packages is like five gigabytes. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely some uh, definitely differences in cost. Um, and then system requirements as well. Um, uh, they could rely on um, like other uh, languages like C, C++. Um, if you're doing like Bayesian analytics, you might utilize um, uh, JAGS and um, while using our JAGS. Um, so, and that, that can require some uh, additional complexity trying to figure out how to get those working on your system. Uh, yeah, also Java. Uh, the Stas says uh, the book is too optimistic that a package will always compile. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, also, uh, maintenance capacity, um, if you're looking at like source code on GitHub, um, you want to make sure that the package that you're re relying on is um, maintained so you can, uh, if there's a bug uh, downstream with that package, then it's going to affect uh, your package as well. So, so that's something you want to be mindful of just, um, and I don't know if there's a hard or fast rule for figuring out if a package is being maintained or not, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, functional functionality, um, outsourcing broadly used functions uh, saves you time. Um, yeah, you don't. You definitely don't need to um, reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, there's, uh, there's definitely benefits and uh, trade offs for um, using those dependencies. Um, so then they get into. Um, uh, preferring a holistic, balanced, and quali quantitative approach. Um, uh, who's the primary audience for this? Um, holistic, uh, that would be uh, users will likely have more dependencies installed than other developers. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, uh, if you're working, I, I think especially if you're working like primarily by yourself or maybe with a limited amount of other um, R users, then you don't mind as much if uh, you need all these dependencies installed on your system. Um, there's also a balanced approach um, the trade-off of adding a dependency, 
um, compared to removing a dependency. Um, yeah, there, I, I like that approach. Um, um, but I guess there's always different um, levels of balanced uh, Um, Rebecca says, interesting that they left the lubricate here example in with language suggestion that the function still exists. Sorry, that's jumping ahead a smidge. I was okay. Just, I'm uh, like, wait, uh, tangent, tangent. Um, I think that's, is that a namespace section? Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll reread it. Um, once we get there, um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, then the quantitative approach. Um, I think we might have covered some of these uh, in previous weeks, but um, you can use packages like it depends, um, which I don't, I'm not sure if we commented on previously, um, but the pack package also, um, it also goes into uh showing how much dependencies like a package relies on um and i wonder if i can switch over to the book real quick to see show what that looks like i think uh yeah Yeah, so it, there's the function um, package depths tree, um, which you can uh, you can use that function for any package, and it'll show you um, uh, what it depends on, and and you'll even see um, the the memory, the size requirement as well. Um, yeah, there's there's some other cool functions as well, like. Uh, depths explain which um I, I think this goes into more of um like this depends on this kind of thing um but yeah i think those uh both it depends and in, in pack are um good for um bring a more quantitative approach to that subject. Okay, let me where did my notes go? We've got another another chat. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll get to the chat in a little bit. Um so then they had some uh, dependency thoughts specific just to the tidyverse. Um, and, you know, if you learn one thing from this book, um, I, I hope you learned several things. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, never, never depend on tidyverse or dev tools. Um, instead, depend on the specific package within that instead um, that implements the functionality that you need. Um, yeah, if you only need like, um, I'm trying to think of a, a tidyverse. I'm, I'm not sure if the read CSV is tidyverse or not, but like if that's all you need, and you load the tidyverse, then yeah, you uh, avoid that, I guess. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, tidyverse and dev tools have large uh, recursive dependencies, both uh, over a hundred. Um, here are some uh, uh, what they say free or low level tidy dependencies um, with. I think minimal 
uh, dependencies that I can't remember if these uh, had zero or like maybe one or two. Um, but yeah, Arlang, Glue, Wither, um, some of the, the free ones. Um, and if you're building a package and you uh, run the R command check, uh, it will throw a note for including more than 20 uh, non-default package dependencies. Um, and I, I need to go back to the book to see, I forget what non-default meant. Um, yeah, so these are notes. So I think with any notes, they uh, suggest that you want to try to um, get rid of as many as you can um, with the knowledge that there might be some that you inevitably can't get rid of. Um, yeah, I, th I thought this might say what non-default means, but um, I'm guessing maybe packages not from CRAN or, um, yeah, we've got, uh, oh. Yeah, that's that's my interpretation of that. Um, so whether to import or suggest, um, yeah, this, this was also one that was, um, at least going in was, uh, a bit confusing, um, imports must be run at runtime. Um, so it automatically installs missing packages when your package is installed. Um, dev tools load all checks as well. Um, so it's installed, but not attached. Um, to, to attach, you would use um, a package name function within the package. So that's, um, yeah, that's what that looks like importing. Dplyr, tidier. Um, so suggest your package can use these packages, but doesn't require them. Um, isn't ter terribly relevant for a package where the user base is approximately equal to the development team. Um, so if you do have something that's for a wider audience, um, then perhaps like suggests might be relevant to you. Um, so it does not automatically install missing packages when your package is installed. Um, yeah, it says add for development tasks or to unlock additional functionality. Uh, for example, run test, uh, build vignettes, examples, or rarely needed packages or tricky packages. Um, yeah, so if you, I guess if you have a package that you think would be nice but not necessary, that that, that could be something that you put first suggest. Um, and I think tricky packages, um, like if for whatever reason it might be hard to install for um, your user base, maybe it is something that requires like those outside dependencies like uh, Java or, or JAGS or whatever that maybe you do want to put it in suggest as well. Uh, Stas says, so if you have a suggest dependency that you use in a vignette but is not on CRAN, will CRAN check fail? Yeah. Um, oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Anything, pretty sure anything that's in um, imports or suggests has to be on 
crayon or bioconductor mm. or crayon. I think. <laughs> I'm sure that is written somewhere. Okay. Uh, crayon is um, like a black box to me other than <laughs> downloading whatever I need from crayon. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, John. Um, okay. Oh, and then, yeah, some of those uh, uh, rarely needed packages like maybe maybe you don't need ggplot2 or um, for testing uh, test that can be in the suggest okay uh, all right now we're uh, getting to the namespace um, conversation um, so the motivation um, like why namespace um, it provides context for looking up volume of an object um, associated with a name, uh, hence namespace. Um, so this uh, this operator um, is very useful here in this context. Um, uh, definitely something to um, be aware of if you're not already familiar with. Um, for example, if you have a function that's the same name um, from two different packages, the order in which you load or, yeah, in which you call the packages um, will determine which of those functions gets um, ran. Uh, so our defaults to, um, the last loaded, uh, package. Um, so on the example on the left, uh, you load here last, then that's the function that, that gets used. And then lubridate, that's, that would be the function, um, And I'm going to go back to that comment from earlier. Um, yes, it's so interesting that they left the lubridate here example in with language suggesting that the functions still exist. But am I wrong in reading that has not been in lubridate namespace since 2019? Um, I was just curious what lubridate here did and went on a small get. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, I just, yeah, I just assumed that it, um, was still a function. Um, so yeah, they took it out of their namespace, um, Yeah, really not important. I just yeah. had seen it as an example a few times and was curious what the function actually did because I'm definitely in the habit of here hearing everything. Yeah. But and I knew it originated from some conflict, but anyway, yeah. I was like, what does the Luberta here even do? And the help didn't get me anywhere. So I went to GitHub, but <laughs> not important. I'm just surprised that given that the book, this version of the book is very recent, that this is still the example they reach for. Yeah, did you see oh, the, uh, I, they have an issue and they just haven't gotten to it, basically. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, All right. I think, uh, like, they got to the end and that's when they realized that it was still there and they're like, well, I, oh, I'm totally sick this point, at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> not, not a big deal whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was I was looking at the um, Lubridate issues and not the not the book issues. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's that's interesting. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, 
Yeah, so so order matters if if you're not using the the operator. Um, so they uh, it's recommended to use uh, the package. Um, I'm not sure what the name for this operator is called, but package function uh, syntax where dependencies in code below are. Um, package namespace saves us from uh, potential user redefinitions of functions. Um, I think in the book they gave us an example, um, the standard deviation function in stats um, relies on the var function. Um, and they changed the var function in the global namespace um, to some random function. Um, and so, yeah, you don't, you don't want, uh, you, you wouldn't want that to be an issue to, to pop up. Um, Another, another chat. Uh, I did not explicitly know this. Um, not important. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just I really liked that because I don't I didn't I don't think I really knew that at any deep level. So I appreciated them walking through what happens if you do that. Okay. And how namespaces are used. Yeah. Yeah. This this uh, section was great. Um, the uh, the actual namespace file, like what that looks like. Um, so it's generated by Roxygen 2. Um, do not edit, edit this by hand. Um, and each line, uh, maybe it looks like R code, but um, each line contains a directive. Um, there's the export for exporting a function, which we, um, just saw with the Lubridate package, um, including S3 and S4 generics. Um, read uh, advanced R for more on that. Um, S3 method for um, exporting S3, S3 method. Um, import from, uh, import selected object from another namespace. Import and uh, use din lib. Um, and I think that's for, uh, like if you're using C, C++ code, um, et cetera. Um, and I think they did mention like a few of these, like they're like, oh, you don't necessarily need this or you, you might only need this for like uh, very specific scenarios um, and use dinlib was one of those. Um, so each line is generated by Roxygen 2. Uh, this method is preferred because um, namespace tags are inter integrated into the source code. Um, and what you need to do, you only need to learn uh, like the export at export and then like you put that in your code and Roxygen 2 will like figure out the rest of it to uh, write out those specific directives. Um, and yeah, it, it takes on the burden of of writing the namespace in a, in a clean ma manner. Just gonna... Uh, Stas says in applied, um, non-development projects library conflicted shows the conflicts um, for development work is too much, but maybe you can include it in test to see if you referred to the wrong here or filter. Yeah, uh, yeah, good comment. Um, I try to include that in the updated slides, but I have the old slides here. Um, yeah. That that will um, instead of using that um, 
format with package function name. Uh, you can just run the conflicted library and like give it a rule that says like, give me this function um, every time for the conflict. Um, yeah, so that's that's helpful. Um, I think that also in the note, there was like another method, but um, I didn't look too much um, into that method. It, it looked more complicated. Yeah, so this, uh, like, getting into, like, the why of that problem and, and how R um, determines which which function to utilize. Um, so that gets into um, the search path. And so this is more motivation behind um, the namespace. Um, so where does R look for an object? Um, first, uh, the global environment, um, the packages that have been attached in reverse order. Um, that was like going back to how it determines those conflicts, um, going back to the order of when it was loaded, um, auto loads and the base environment. Um, if you, I'll go to the book, um, I think, Yeah, if you if you run the code, um, if you run the function search, um, it will print out the search path um, in your project or or whatever environment you're working in. Um, so for the book, um, this is the or these are these are the packages that um, the book relies on and. Uh, it's search path, like the order. Yeah, so that that, um, like, a useful can be a useful function to figure out like what packages you have. Um, so adding another package uh, changes the search path. Um, uh, but fortunately, this is not applicable to package code. Um, so if you've um, gone through advanced R um, already or or read some of it, um, you may be familiar fil uh, excuse me, you may be familiar with um, some of these concepts. Um, but, uh this section was was borrowed and, and developed from uh advanced R chapter on environments. Um so we have two environments. Um uh the package environment, which is external interface with parent determined by search path and exposes exported objects and the namespace environment internal interface, including all objects in the package. Um, and this is a very uh, short overview of this concept. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely recommend going through the uh, section again, if, if you need to, I, I know I probably will have to. Um, and another plug for Advanced R. That's a that's a great book as well. Um, every namespace environment has the same ancestors. Um, imports environment controlled by the namespace file. Um, the base namespace um, base environment bindings, and the global environment. Um, and so this, uh, 
yeah, this might not make a lot of sense just looking at it. Um, maybe we can build up to this image through the book chapter. Uh, so this is showing the, this, this will build up to that, um, that image, or at least try to. Um, so going back to the um, search path, um, this is kind of what it looks like um, graphically uh, with auto loads and base um, at the at the bottom. Um, and if you add a new package, then um, then that's what it looks like getting added. Uh, yeah, it changes the structure and in order of your um, environment. Okay, so let's build up to that picture. Um, so the example they give is the um, standard deviation function in the stats package. Um, So figure 10.3 depicts the standard deviation function as a rectangle with a rounded edge. That's this. The arrows from package stats and namespace stats uh, show that standard deviation is bound in both of these um, uh, namespace and, and uh, package stats. Uh, but the relationship is not symmetric. Um, the black circle with an arrow pointing back to namespace indicates where a standard deviation will look for objects that it needs in the namespace environment, not the package environment. Okay, and then this is showing the, the relationship um, for for namespace to, to imports to the base namespace all the way up to global environment. And then this is, um, yeah, this is what it looks like all together. Um, Yeah, uh, I will. I will leave. I will leave the rest up to the reader on that. Um, but definitely, uh, feel free to put any comments or questions in the chat. Um, so the last section of this chapter is on attaching versus loading. Um, if a package is installed, uh, loading makes a package available in memory, but not added to the search path. And attaching puts package in the search path. Um, technically, library loads, then attaches the package. Um, and there are uh, four different functions that make a package available. Um, loading, load namespace, or require namespace, and then attaching um, the library function, um, which is probably most uh, familiar and require. Uh, library is great for data analysis or vignettes, but um, not for packages. Um, uh, use required namespace um, to specify different behavior based on package being installed. Um, and then whether to import or depend. Um, 
imports package will be loaded and for depends, the package will be attached. Um, uh, they favor uh, imports over depends as depends changes the global landscape. Um, and I think there was one other, like, maybe it was a resource at the end of this chapter, um, or maybe I saw it in a comment from one of the previous uh, cohorts. Ah, um, yeah, this blog post looked interesting. Um, just comparing library versus require. Um, and I think I've seen um, like Stack Overflow questions on like the differences between those as well. Awesome. Uh, I think that is the end of the notes. Um, I'm not sure if I've caught up all the way on the comments in the chat. Let me just make sure. Um, it looks like I have. Oh, uh, I might have missed this comment earlier. Stas said, I had to work on limited functionality systems that did not have the proper C compilers. Uh, so no binary, uh, no install. Cool. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah, I will leave it at that for this week. Um, before we all go, uh, I'll open the floor for um, questions or comments from anyone. Um, yeah, Trevin, I was wondering if we could go back to suggests for a minute. Um, I know you talked about this and I might've just missed something, but I'm a little bit confused still about suggests. Um, and I guess where my confusion is coming from is like, how do you define sort of extra functionality for the package versus core functionality? Um, you know, would, would it be appropriate to, to include a package listed in suggests if like there's one function in your package that requires that and that would be like unlocked if you had that package loaded, but it's not um, required. They, they, they talk about unlocking additional functionality like um, running tests and building vignettes, um, are there other, I guess I, I need more of an example of when that would be appropriate. Um, I do, I am curious about your um, comment on like, if you need uh, just one function from a package. Um, or just one function in your package maybe that requires that, that, that depends on another package. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Um, when they say build vignettes, does that actually mean like, like build, like the doing the developer side, like creation of the vignettes? I'm not sure why that would require a package that the rest of the package wouldn't require. I don't know. I'm just a little confused about suggests. The idea would be like, if you have, um, you know, maybe you do some dplyr work on the mm -hmm. result in the vignette, but the your package doesn't actually do anything with dplyr specifically. Oh, okay. And mm. so you could put dplyr and suggest so that the <clears throat> vignette can build. But if you're just downloading it from CRAN, you would need to have dplyr. Got it. Got it. Okay. So there wouldn't. So pretty much, if you're going to be using, if you're going to be using a dependency actually in the functions of the package that you want your users to be able to use that shouldn't that would never be a suggests that would always be one of the others right you can have um like optional functions okay um, and those can be in suggests okay. and there are things that we're going to go into probably next chapter actually about kind of how to deal with that okay um i i have run into a lot of problems with things there where it's 
in suggests, I, actually, I guess it's a lot better now because they tell you explicitly why it fails mm -hmm. um, really cleanly and pretty, prettily. But it used to be that you could run something and you're like, it's not working. Why is this not working? Oh, I don't have this suggested package. Okay. Um, and that can be really annoying. I think it can still be an issue if you're doing things like um, doing, you know, like a workflow in parallel with tidy models um, somewhere deep in there, it hits an issue where it doesn't have a package and it like tells you in a nested tibble somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think they've gotten a lot better about it. That's where I used to run into it. It drove me crazy. Um, so that's the only thing to watch out for is if you have, like, if you have a thing where uh, the package is kind of hidden in suggest because it won't auto install when, mm -hmm. you know, when people are installing your package, then just make sure it's really clear. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. That helps. Yeah. Thanks, John. That, yeah, I wasn't sure about the vignette, but that makes sense. Like if you have deep plier in your vignette, but not anywhere else, then yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah. And I think, I think for this one, like, so maybe there's only one function that needs the package. Um, so yeah, I guess if you, created um, some function to like make a fancy plot or whatever using like ggplot. Maybe that's something that uh, you would utilize suggest for. Um, like if that was the only case where you use ggplot or maybe it's like a different like fancy mapping package. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I should know this, and maybe we're going to get this, get into this in uh, dependencies in practice. Um, uh, when we talked about like not loading the whole tidyverse, but maybe you want, um, maybe you want like read R from the tidyverse. Um, what if you just want like one function from readr, like read CSV, um, can you, I think you can. So maybe the question is how do you, um, uh, make the dependency only on that one function? You can't formally yet. Okay. There's so there's a Arlang um function slash concept of um standalones that some packages now have these files that you can import from the package and it just copies the file basically and it comes with information about like what does that file depend on and things like that. And then there's also a package um box. I can't remember if that's on CRAN or not. Oh but, yeah. Um it it's for like exporting a single function kind of as a package, sort of, um, so that you can use it somewhere else. Um neither of those is like really like well supported yet, but it's it seems to be something that the tidy team is thinking about. And then it's also something that uh Syncra in Europe is thinking about. So two of the mm. teams that do a lot of open source work. <laughs> um, it's because that's that's definitely a thing in other languages. So um, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see if anything comes to that. Okay, huh. Yeah, I think Box was on, has been on my radar, but I've never really looked into it. And uh, I guess I assumed that that was already like, functionality that could be done. <laughs> um, yeah, I just started looking at uh, that from... Oh, okay. Actually, that yeah, one's cool. not... 
it's not who I was thinking it was. So anyway, it's an active old like uh, social media <laughs> our person. Hmm. Well, um, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that some more. Um, any other uh, any other questions or or comments um, from from folks? So, um, question that is probably already covered earlier in the mm -hmm. book, but um, you have to import all non functions that you use from non base packages. Is that correct? So, like even the even like matrix or survival and stuff that are um, the recommended packages that get installed with R, but not the truly base. Is that mm -hmm. a, accurate distinction yeah you don't you have to import you have to say that you use that yeah. package even though it shouldn't matter just to but just to make um the check not freak out about where does this function come from like everything will still run oh. but um the checks will say oh i don't know where this function comes from it's like well but you have it <laughs> so stop <laughs> complaining okay um so yes, you have to, you know, um, there are a lot of things in uh, utils or stats that you don't realize necessarily aren't directly in base, mm -hmm. like they're really basic functions. So um, I've had to import things from utils before for sure. Yeah, good question. Right. Any uh, any other questions or or comments? Um, I will go to the Slack. Um, just to check on the volunteer page and and where we're at. I think we're pretty well set for the next few weeks. Um. Yeah. So into February, it looks like we have uh, like. All the weeks signed up. Uh, Rebecca will um, finish up the dependencies talk next week on dependencies in practice. Um, yeah, I guess just a note that there are slides built for chapters 11 and 12, but it doesn't look like um, those are there for chapters 13, 14, and 15. Um, so yeah, just to make a note of that, um, after that, we'll have some daylight savings uh, that we need to deal yeah. with. Um, and there, then there's some open spots for finishing up. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for um, coming and, and interacting. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, hope to see you next week as we uh, finish up dependencies. Thank you.